Hi, everybody. Welcome. Come in. Make yourselves comfortable. You are here for a webinar all about audiobooks. So if you're in the wrong classroom, you can check your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but I think everybody should be in the right place. All right, good. We got a lot of people rolling. Yeah. In. Yeah. Go ahead and feel free to say hello um, in the chat. Yes. Hello, Let everyone. Where you um Coming Thanks from. for flying Fly, Flight 442 on audio air with us today. <laughs> if you are not here for the audiobook flight, yeah, I let just, an attendant know. Yeah, I just um, opened the chat. It was off for some reason. But oh, great. To... Love to know where everybody's coming in from. Scotland, Chicago, Michigan, New Mexico. Yay! Got a nice cloud. Oh, South Berwick. I go camping. I used to go camping in South Berwick. Hi, nice homie. You, Mary Lou. <laughs> All right. Hello, hello, everybody. Dublin, Texas. Now that's confusing. I'm now I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks for everyone for joining. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm going to do um, some housekeeping in the intro and then I will turn it over to Tina. So the first thing is that um, if you could benefit from closed captions that is available by clicking the CC box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can also toggle it on and off from there as well. We have a Q&A box today so if you have questions for Tina please use the Q&A box. You also have the ability to upvote questions. So if you see a question that's similar to yours or a question that you would really love to know the answer to, you could go ahead and click the thumbs up and that will push that question to the top of the list. Um, depending on how many questions there are, I can't promise we'll get to all of them today. So definitely utilize that um, feature. Okay, and now here's Tina Deeth is an award-winning and internationally acclaimed speaker, audiobook publisher, corporate podcast producer, and vocal leadership expert who has been featured on media outlets including ABC, Inc.com, Huffington Post, and Forbes. Tina's first podcast, The Start Something Show, was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 35 podcasts for entrepreneurs, and Tina's company, Twin Brain Studios, amplifies the influence of brands and leaders through high ROI audiobook and podcasting solutions. And I should uh, mention that Twin Flame Studios is also a sponsor of the Women in Publishing Summit. So um, Tina, we're so happy to have you here today and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Nancy. I appreciate that. And I'm so grateful for uh, for you and for Alexa for inviting me in and bringing me into this beautiful community. Uh, I have, I've had the pleasure of speaking at one of other uh, Alexa's groups uh, about a month ago, and the reception has just been so warm and so kind. And I really appreciate that because I think that when a world of authors where everybody is looking to share their voice, it's um, it becomes a really beautiful space. And uh, I am very tender today, actually, because I have actually, um, I'm really moved by the number of people, an extraordinary number of people registered for this webinar today. And I've spoken to many large groups in my life. But what really gets me is we're talking about unleashing your voice to millions of people. And the implication of that, the implication of good people who have something to say, who want to leave their mark on the world, being willing to step forward and share their voice in a world that doesn't always welcome that really moves me to my core. And while I promise I will not cry through this entire webinar, I'm going to do it just for a moment. <laughs> well, before we get into the nitty gritty of audiobooks. So let me just go ahead and, and get started here today. Um, and I do have some slides to share with you, but my main goal is to really be with you and to be of service to you today. 
So we cry all the time. Thank you. I appreciate the comradery. Thank you so much. All right, good. And you guys are going to hear my my clicking. Let me get my slide started here. There we go. And it, it it's funny because uh, I have did a whole uh, shoot my face the a uh, couple of months ago, and my assistants insisted on this picture, which was actually one of my least favorite pictures, because I'm like, oh, my face is round and all these other things. And why I'm mentioning this is because my assistants have a very different view of me than I do. And they're like, that shows your personality. It's welcoming and it's, you know, you, you want to be with people and they're absolutely hundred percent right. So I submitted to their leadership in this particular case in thinking that, you know what, we don't always know um, or see ourselves the way other people see us. And so that's part of the context that I want you to listen to today as we're going through all this information on audiobooks is how do you listen to yourself and how do you want to be perceived? Because producing an audiobook, or as, and I'm sure you've known already, producing a book is a very transformational process. And so we, our voices transform inside of this process and continue to grow afterwards. So that's a, just a little bit of context I want to toss in before we go further. And thank you again for joining here, particularly if you were able to join here live today, because there are so many distractions that we have. There's so many things pulling us in different places for our attention. You taking the time to spend an hour to learn about this here today, um, I did not again, take that lightly. And I uh, just want to acknowledge that uh, you probably had other things that you could be doing so that you chose here to, to be here. I really want to make that worth your while. All right. So here's all the good stuff that we're going to be covering today. These are some of the promises that I made you in the invitation. We're going to learn if audiobook publication is indeed a good fit for your work. We're going to talk about production, how to get production handled, the timing on production. I'm a bit of a fire hose, uh, so I'm glad you're going to have the recording. I will also have some follow-up information for you, notes and best practices and things like that that you'll have access to for free to download. Um, I'll get you that information at the end. So if you are not a, no a native note taker, I'm not a native note taker, Please just relax and be present because we will make sure you have the information at the end. We're gonna talk about distribution. How do you get your work out there into the hearts and ears that need you? And we're going to talk about your bottom line. We'll talk about royalties. We're gonna talk about expanding your audience, all those things that we, you know, we need to have, the return on our investment of time and talent and money. And I'd like to leave at least 15, if not 20 minutes for Q&A at the end, because uh, I am a former business coach. I still co do a lot of coaching. I'm actually a therapist by training. Um, I also have a theater background, as you can imagine, uh, working in audio. And all of that combination basically means that I am excellent at coming up with creative problem solving in the moment and spontaneously. And so I would like to leave a lot of time for, for Q&A, which means that I am going to be moving through some of this material kind of quickly. But again, we will have the replays for you. Well, why pu publish an audiobook anyway? Let's take a moment to pause that. And we always poll our authors. We've worked with more than 250 nonfiction authors. And here's what they have to say. If you want to put in the chat why you published a book or why you're in the process of publishing a book, that's actually really good to know. So if you want to pop that into the chat, uh, as I'm going through some of these reasons, you can see if your reasons match up with our author's reasons. Create a new income stream is always the top answer that we get, which is very closely associated with, of course, selling more books, right? You can't get your word out there uh, with a book unless you sell the book. So those are the two most obvious answers. Reach a wider audience is our third most popular answer. Expansion of an audience, more ears, more eyes, more hearts open to you. This one comes up more often than you might think, and that is raising the chances of being selected as a speaker. One of the things that we hear from event planners is that if they have two speakers who are kind of equally qualified, if one speaker has additional things that they've done that the other speaker hasn't, like produce an audiobook or have a podcast, that actually helps their chances of being selected as a speaker. 
Making work more accessible is an answer we're getting more and more, particularly for populations who are visually impaired or who are neurodivergent. Uh, there are tons of people out there who uh, prefer audio just because they prefer the medium, but there's also people who prefer audio because of whatever situation they happen to be in that their ears simply are a medium that work better for them to consume information. Leaving a more powerful legacy. Anyone can put a post out there or a blog post or even a book out there that lasts for a moment, but will the work last for 10 or 20 or 30 years? That's the type of quality and that's the type of enduring message that we're always looking to create with our authors. And then there's intimacy. Uh, I had the pleasure of being the lead interviewer for a documentary on podcasting called The Messengers. And I got to interview about 40 or 50 different independent podcasters, most of whom did not know each other. And in that process, what amazed me, what came up in every single interview was the word intimacy. And I, my further research that I found on audio in general is that audio is, tends to be considered the most intimate form of media. It's the most accessible form, certainly. You can read or you can listen when you can't read. You can listen when you can't watch. But there is something about becoming a voice in somebody's mind, becoming a voice in somebody's ear, right? I'll be the first person to admit I got a lot of voices in my head. Maybe you're the same. But becoming a trusted voice in somebody's head is such a privilege. And that's what we get to do with audio. Using the content of your audiobook for marketing is a very important part. The audiobook is the central piece that we're going after, but all the ways you can use your audiobook is a whole other animal that often gets overlooked because we're so focused on just getting the book out or just getting the audiobook out or you know those kinds of things, right? It's like going through a, a pregnancy and a birthing process of this product, but then there's the whole parenting of that asset that you have afterwards as you're bringing your work and your voice out into the world. And that's closely related to making courses or products from the audiobook content. So that's what our authors have to say. Now, let's talk a little bit about purpose. Um, now, if you registered for this webinar, you saw my credentials, you saw what lovely things Nancy had to say. So I don't tend to, in these presentations, spend a lot of time trying to convince you of my credibility. Um, we're all adults. We can all kind of benevolently stalk each other on the internet and find out our credentials and if we are who we say we are. Um, but what I think goes even deeper than credentials and accolades and being featured on different media outlets and all of that, all of which is wonderful. And I'm grateful to be able to do that and, and to have my work accepted into those outlets and for having you know, been an entrepreneur for almost 20 years now in various capacities. Um, you know, I'm, that, that tickles me every day to be able to go out and create and lead my team but comes down to purpose. And I've said for a long time that when I look back on it, I never could have predicted that I would have ended up in this place in my career. Um, you know, give me a, a shout out in the chat or in the um, reactions if you feel the same way. Like you never could have predicted you were gonna end up where you were, but when you look back on it, you go, oh, actually that makes sense. So I've said for a long time that audiobooks and podcasts are, or excuse me, audiobooks and podcasts are right up my alley because books and microphones were some of my best friends from when I was a very young age. So here's the CEO of Twin Flames Studios, a <laughs> very young Tina Ingracia at the time uh, when I was on season one, and I was also on season three of Reading Rainbow. Uh, and I so deeply loved uh, books and had the opportunity to be on the show. Sadly, did not get to meet LeVar Burton. But I would encourage you, uh, and maybe you've done this through the process of writing your book, but we're all connected back to our roots and our purpose. Generally, from a very young age, we find those seeds. And when we've talked with our authors, uh, we find that we are in really good company around this. Uh, these are a few of our, of our authors who are out doing amazing things in the world. I'm always 
um, astounded every day to find out what our authors are out creating in the world. But these are just a few. Jennifer Brown is one of the foremost uh, uh, DEI uh, consultants in North America has been a crusader for many years for inclusion. And on a similar note, Dr. Mesa Akbar uh, has been, you know, working on the healing of racial trauma for decades. Um, Dr. Ming Wang is a incredibly world-renowned laser eye surgeon. He's created devices and uh, patents and entirely new surgical techniques to give people their sight back. And um, his origin story coming from China is incredibly, incredibly moving. And Scott Shute, who's the head of mindfulness and compassion programs at LinkedIn, he's a total pioneer in bringing mindfulness and compassion into the corporate world. And so to have the privilege of working with people who have purpose like this is uh, one of the things that myself, my team, that inspires us every day. Everyone's voice is unique. Everyone's purpose is valid and rich and worth exploring. And um, this is one of the things that we we really love getting everybody's voices out into the world. And I, you know, I have to say that while Scott and Jennifer chose to narrate their own book, Dr. Mesa and Dr. Ming did not. And yet their books had the same type of um, reception out in, in the book world about their audiobook. We'll talk a little bit about why that's the case in a, in a little while when we get into the production side of things. Let's talk a little bit about numbers. And I get asked a lot about, well, how many books actually sell? Uh, how do you get a book to sell? Um, you know, can you actually stand out on a market? Is it saturated? Well, here's, here's the numbers, and this is all from the Audio Publishing Association. This is uh, independent studies that are done every year. If anyone wants the original materials, I'm happy to get that to you. So in 2021, $1.6 billion in sales in the U.S. alone for audiobooks. This is a 25% increase in sales in 2021 over 2020. And that's 10 straight years of double digit sales growth. Back when I started, uh, before I started the company and I got interested in audiobooks, um, almost nobody saw the audiobook trend happening. When audiobooks went digital, they stopped being produced as much on CD, um, or in my case, I mean, I'm old enough to remember books on tape. But they were growing at 20, 23, 25, one year, 35% a year. And the publishing industry wasn't paying attention. It was one of the big reasons that I decided to go pivot my business coaching practice at the time and start working with audio was because there was a whole population of my colleagues and my clients who were out doing great work in the world and publishing books, but they weren't getting their voice out on audio. They didn't know how, they didn't know it was possible. And there weren't a lot of resources for them to do it at the time. So that was the gap we were looking to fill. And we have, because nearly half of adult Americans listen to audiobooks, and the average audiobook listener listens to about 10 audiobooks a year. One trend I wanted to bring your attention to that came up in 2021, and I bet y'all can guess why this trend is happening. There's been a 34% increase in listeners for self-help titles in 2021. Guess is why? Yes, because we're all losing our minds because of the pandemic and all of the crazy uncertainty that's going on right now. So this is really great news, particularly for nonfiction authors, but it's also great news for the listeners because this means that people are seeking help. They're seeking answers. They are pulling them, pulling themselves forward, looking to get better. And that is fantastic news. And we as, as healers, as leaders, we are in a position to help more people who are looking for us. And the cost of audiobook production is 50% less in 2022 than in 2010 for independent authors. That always shocks everybody. That has to do with the transition from manual processes to digital processes. I mentioned before, we had books on tape, we had books on CD. Everything is digital now. We record our authors from home most of the time, uh, from a distance. So we eliminate the need to having to go into studios. Um, same thing with narrators. They can record from home studios. The cost of equipment has gone down. All of these factors combined and the 
the cost of distribution isn't very high. So that makes the the cost of, of production of audio very reasonable compared to a lot of other mediums. Now we're going to talk some best practices. All right. I said it was a fire hose. I'm just going to take a quick minute and double check the Q&As while we're here. I will answer a bunch of these questions at the end. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for posting all of these questions. We are going to cover a lot of this, and then we were going to go back through it at the end. I will make sure your questions get answered. This is great. Thank you. That is so cool. All right. So let's talk strategy uh, best practices. We're going to talk about the best time to start your audiobook, the best time to launch your audiobook, timelines, and then I'm going to give you my hot take. All right, best time to start your audiobook. Now, how I'd like you to hear this is this isn't the only time to start your audiobook, but if we had to optimize it for an ideal situation, this is how it's going to be. The best time to start your audiobook is while you're writing your manuscript. Here's why. In an ideal situation, before you get your book to editing, you would read your book out loud. It's called an oral edit. When you read your book out loud, you catch things that you will never catch with your eyes. Your beta readers, readers will never catch with their eyes. Your proofreaders, even your editors won't catch it with their eyes. And it has just has to do with neurologically how things work. If you read your book out loud, you will catch sentences that you would never say in real life. You will catch moments of brilliance that you didn't know that you had, and you will catch errors that you would have glossed over because your eyes are used to filling in the gaps for you. So that is the best time to start your audiobook. I will say that most of our authors don't start that early, but fortunately, we have the privilege of working with a lot of publishers, book coaches, ghostwriters, uh, and other folks who are aware of this best practice, and so that we the content that we end up working with is very, very high quality. Now, the difference is, and we get to the best time to launch your audiobook, and there really isn't just one. As you can imagine, you know, when you get into your initial launch of your audiobook, um, that's a good time, right? And, and, and you've seen this with publishing for many, many years. Standard practice is to do some combination of releasing the ebook version, the hardcover, the paperback, and then the audiobook. That works really well. It extends the life of the launch. And we can talk about uh, that in the marketing section as well. So that's one really good time to launch your audiobook. The other good place is if you want to revive an older title. You know, I, launching a book is challenging, right? There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of heart and soul that goes into it. And things don't always go the way you want, particularly if it was your first book or your second. But nonetheless, you don't have to be stuck with that original launch's results. You can relaunch your work with an audiobook, and that's a wonderful thing to do. So either you're just adding the audiobook and relaunching your work, or in the case of maybe the work having been out for a while and needing a little bit of an update, an audiobook is a great place to add with a second edition of your book. So that, those are the two best times to launch your audiobook. And um, when it comes to publishing and production timelines, my hot take on that is that you really should be able to get it done within 90 days when you have the right support. And that generally is accounting for really busy schedules. Strictly speaking, we could get an audiobook done in probably 45 days. Uh, but with author schedules and time for review, and um, particularly for doing author recording, 90 days all the way through, like your audiobook is live, it's for sale, you're good to go, is a reasonable time frame where nobody gets their hair on fire, despite my little flame there that I got there. So my, my hot take on all of this is you need to look at your overall strategy for your book and see how the audiobook fits into place. And if your audiobook is going to um, be part of your original launch, then your timing of, of your you need to back that up for 90 days so that you do have enough time for it to come out near your launch or within a couple of months after your launch. Um, 
But I do love, love, love it when authors revive their title with an audiobook and give their book and their work new wings, because so many times we hear stories from authors that they wish they could do it over again. We're gonna move on now to distribution options and best practices. And again, if I don't cover every single thing you wanna talk about today, please do leave a, a question. This is enough to make you extremely dangerous around audiobooks, but there is a lot to a lot of moving parts when we're talking about this. Let's talk about Audible. Audible is the 500 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to audiobooks. They have about 60 to 68% of the market share for audiobooks. And uh, they are, of course, under the same umbrella, same company as uh, Amazon. So if you have issues with Amazon, you have issues with Audible. And that's just something that we have to talk through with you if you don't want to do business with Amazon for some reason. You would be giving up a lot of market share by not being in this marketplace. And that's just a decision you have to make individually. There are other places where you can uh, distribute your audiobook. I will talk about those in just a second, but let's talk about royalties because this goes across the board when we're talking about Audible. Audible has a situation where you can distribute exclusively through them, and that gives you about 40% royalty rate. Royalty rates for audiobooks are less than ebooks and some other versions of books uh, because of the technology involved in the distribution and housing of files and whatnot and the updates required and all of that good stuff. Um, so that's the royalty rate across the board uh, if you go exclusive through Audible Amazon and it does go over into uh, Apple Books as well. And so 40%. If you go non-exclusive and you want wider distribution, then you get about 20 to 25% of royalties, but you do get a wider distribution. The self-publishing platform that most independent authors use is called acx.com. And we use this as well. We do not take our author's rights or royalties. We set everything up for you. Everything comes to you. We do not retain anything because we are author advocates. It's one of the big reasons I started the company. Um, back in uh, 2015, when I started um, Twin Flames, nobody was working in a business model where you were, could produce audiobooks and uh, get it out to the world without taking rights or royalties. All the publishers out there were traditional publishers. And quite honestly, as a creator myself, that pissed me off. And that's one of the big motivating reasons I decided to go into this space was to serve more people to get their voices out into the world. So you can use ACX as a DIY platform. Uh, we do use it as, a, as an audition platform and as a distribution platform, depending on the books that we're working with, if it's, that appro if it's appropriate to do so. The other platform is Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices has been around for ages and they recently were purchased by Spotify. This is brand new. Spotify is going into the audiobook market. We're just finding out what they're doing here and um, figuring out if it's actually a good deal for authors to even have their audiobooks on Spotify. So we're doing that research as we speak. So if you decide to download uh, our best practices guide later, um, we don't do a lot of email marketing, but we will send out updates on the industry periodically um, to keep everybody informed. So just so you know, that's something we would do if you want to stay on top of that kind of news. So when it comes to distribution, here's my hot take. You can go exclusive to Audible for 90 days, and then you can switch to non-exclusive. Almost 100% of our authors do just that. They go exclusive to Audible, take advantage of the higher royalty rates and some of the special programs that Audible has, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then after that 90 days, when they've done that launch, push, launch, push, launch, push, then you use your distribution strategy as a marketing strategy. It goes together. Because when you then move to non-exclusive and you go out on to find away voices as well, um, and this is a relatively simple process. We handle this for our authors all the time. Uh, then you can start talking about all the other places that your audiobook is now available. It's not just on Audible. Oh, it's on Downpour. It's on Scribd. It's on, you know, you know, there's about 35 or 40 smaller platforms 
that the audiobook can be put out onto. So that is a wonderful marketing play as well as an accessibility and distribution play. And that is what most of our authors decide to, to go with. Okay, Woo. it's a lot, right? Excellent. Now let's talk about production. The number one rule of audiobooks. This is my holy grail rule of audiobooks. Quality sells. It does not matter if it's an author narrated book or a professionally narrated book. What it needs to be is quality. And that is in the sound quality and in the narration quality. So when it comes to deciding professional versus author narration, there are two crucial questions. This is one of the things we talk through with our authors because we're listening to you. We're listening to your voice. We're listening to what you have to say. And even if an author comes to us and says, everybody says I should narrate my own book. Well, of course, everybody says that you should narrate your own book. They're your people. They are your people. They should be saying that to you. But the truth is, is that you have to ask these two questions. What serves your work best? and what serves you best. If the work is long, you get six, eight, 10 hours of an audiobook, then you have to consider whether it's a good fit for your time and it's a good fit for your situation. From a financial standpoint, audio narr um, author narration and professional narration, we work really hard to keep those two budgets very, very similar so we can take money out of the equation and make it much more about serving the work best uh, and serving you best as the author. You also have to consider your vocal quality. Uh, most of the authors we work with are not professional narrators. A lot of them are professional speakers, but speaking and narrating are two very different skills. And that's why we do full directed narration. You're getting feedback from us in your ear the entire time you're narrating and we're making you sound like a pro because we're coaching and directing you. That's really, really important uh, because if you don't have that feedback, you're just kind of in a vacuum and you don't know what you should sound like to be considered high quality in the audiobook industry. Um, same thing with uh, the, the narrators, right? We are always looking to make sure that your, your narrator has to be not only a good audio fit, and that means their audio quality, and some key qualities of your their voice should match yours. You never want a situation where it's your audiobook, uh, and I'm speaking in the nonfiction realm right now. So folks have fiction questions, we can cover those in the Q&A for sure. But if you are in a, a nonfiction author, you want your narrator to have key vocal qualities that are similar to yours, because then when you go and speak or you're doing podcast interviews, you want you don't want them to be jarred by that massive difference in voice. You also, we also have to audition for energetic similarities. Does it sound like the narrator can own the material? Are they believable? So we get about 150 auditions per book, depending on the type of voice we're looking for. And we vet our narrators four ways before our authors even hear anybody. Uh, and we're looking for all of those qualities. So if you're doing this on your own, this is also something you want to consider if you're looking for a narrator or, or working to do it on your own. Now. I will say one thing about uh, author narration, never, ever, ever do it on your own. If you don't work with my company, then find another qualified audiobook professional to work with, not just a sound studio, not just your friend's sound booth, not just the dude you know who does a podcast. They need to be an audiobook professional because audiobooks are super picky technically about the audio specs that they require and it will get rejected by the public, by the audio publishers. It will get rejected by Audible if it doesn't meet every single picky own little tiny detail. And that's where a lot of authors get caught. Um, we have a lot of people come to us who say, I already recorded my audio book. Can you publish it? We're happy to, but we have to review the files. 99.9% .9 of the time, the files don't meet spec and they have to be re-edited. It takes extra time. It takes extra money. It causes extra stress. Do it right from the beginning. That's uh, that's my that's my main 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 soapbox about recording your own audiobook. 
Okay, I think I've said enough about that. You do want to create synergy between your audiobook and print versions. And what I mean by that is that you may have things in your book that we have to translate on audio. Um, URLs, uh, call out questions, um, graphs and charts or things like that. There's all kinds of ways to do that in audio. But what also works really well in audio is to create calls to action, gentle, make sense calls to action. You know, you don't want to get all Ginsu knife demonstration, you know, but wait, there's more. You know, there's places for that in the world. It's not in your audiobook. But you want to create those those gentle calls to actions where it makes sense in the audiobook. We do that with you, and that are going to bring people back to your website, where hopefully you may have some bonus materials for them, or you may have additional resources for them, or a PDF companion that goes with the audiobook that maybe has the images or charts or graphs or downloads of some kind. That is being of high service to your listener, and it's going to bring people back to you to develop a further relationship with you. So that synergy is really important. Um, I actually think I covered most of my hot take on my soapbox already on, on this particular one. Um, but we can, again, I always get a lot of questions about uh, microphones and things like that. Uh, those are all things I'm happy to cover in the Q&A. Okay, let's talk about launch. Excuse me, just a second. Okay. This is flying by, my friends, flying by. We already talked briefly about extending the life of your book launch by using your audiobook and having that come out a couple of months later. Uh, and in the case of the relaunch of your book, this is where you're engaging, uh, re-engaging your existing audience. So both of these, these things, extending the life of your book launch, engaging your existing audience, you're using the audiobook as a book as another way to repurpose your material and talk about the same thing, but in a different way. So resist the urge to get tired of your own work. You will get tired of your own work before your audience does. So this is where you have to embody your inner Stephen Covey. Think about how many times Stephen Covey had to talk about the seven habits of highly successful people in order to become a household name. If he had just done an audiobook bestseller launch, he never would have been a household name. How many times did he have to say those seven damn habits over and over again? That's the kind of perseverance I want you to embody when you think about getting your work out into the world. Your audiobook is an evergreen marketing asset. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. It should be on your website. It should be on your social media. It should be in your courses. It should be everywhere. So this video racked up over 100,000 views on Facebook. I'm not gonna show you the whole, whole thing, but I will show you a little tiny bit of it because it's gorgeous. People believe that truth is out there and that it can be understood at the level of thinking. Oh. The common belief is that it's just a matter of gaining knowledge of truth by means of discovery. It is further believed that one can use this knowledge, this thought gained truth, as a means to explain the past and control the future. Since people believe situations cause their suffering, if truth can control events, it can also control their suffering. All right, I'm just gonna, whoa, didn't mean to do that. I'm gonna jump to the end here. So you can see there's a call to action at the end where the book is, all of that good stuff on the video. So this is a video trailer. And this is something that social media eats up. It certainly is evergreen on your website. These are audiograms. You may have seen these on social media. Uh, this is for an author named Michael Bungay Stanier, who is many, many, many times sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies of his book. Um, we had the pleasure of working with him on his last two books. And uh, here's just a little example. If we stay focused and steadfast on why we exist, it always gives us some... So one of the things that Michael did in this particular book, and we do a lot of this, is he had multiple voices. He actually, we translated interviews into the audiobook to create more engagement. Currently, our record for number of voices on an audiobook is 35. You need to make sure you're forming relationships with people who are nothing like you. You need to make sure you're forming relationships. We stay, ah, 
Okay. And another great place to use your book and your audio book is in a limited series podcast. We actually have a limited series podcast coming out next week called Now with Fiona. Um, her book, Our Bisexual is Just Greedy, is actually releasing in uh, around Thanksgiving. And so the limited series podcast is being used to create buzz for the launch and it is being used in her pre-launch. And it is an absolutely wonderful podcast. It's going to be nine episodes and then she's going to decide after if she wants to do a season two. So limited series podcasting is a fantastic way to utilize your book content and create marketing assets while you're creating additional thought leadership content while you're engaging interviews. Um, it's a fabulous strategy to, to continue to develop your thought leadership and create awareness about your book. Okay. And then I mentioned before that there are some special programs that I want to make you aware of when you go exclusive through Aud um, uh, Audible. So Audible will pay you for finding them new authors. The Audible Bounty program is basically you get these special URLs when you publish through Audible exclusively. And if you use those URLs to promote your audiobook on social and email and, and so on, then uh, they may get your book for free if they are a new Audible customer. Somebody goes out, they download your book, they get it for free. However, if they stay an Audible customer for 60 days or more, and most people do once they get hooked on audiobooks, Audible sends you $75, yay, which is going to be much more than your, of course, your average uh, book royalty. Audible also will give you gift codes, uh, usually for the UK and the US. And these are things that you can use to raffle off. You can use them to give away. Uh, you can use them in all different ways as bonuses for people um, to, to get your book and to use in promotion as well. These are also great to use for uh, review copies if you want uh, reviewers on your book, because while on Audible, you will see your Amazon reviews for your book. The Audible reviews are separate and having reviews on Audible does make your book easier to find in the Audible algorithm. They need to be authentic and whoever leaves you a review has to own your book. And this goes along with uh, book giveaways. If here's, here's a funny thing about audiobooks. If you have an audiobook version of your book and you have an ebook version of your book and you participate in an ebook giveaway, you take your book price down to zero, or you take your book price down to $1.99 to do a special promotion or a giveaway, you will also see a spike in your audiobook sales. Because when people go specifically to Amazon and they see all your different versions of your book, they get a case of what I like to call might as well-itis. And they will purchase, they'll get your ebook for free or for on the cheap. And then they'll go, oh, they have the audio audiobook there. Hey, I have audible credits. I want to go back and forth between those two versions. I'll be a lot more likely to finish the book if I can listen to it and then go back to reading it when I want to. Very, very common uh, buying pattern that we see in the industry. Okay, we're going to move into Q&A. Uh, quick note before I do, I'm going to put two links in the chat for you um, in just a minute after I stop the sharing, because I'm going to stop sharing this so that I can just we can just talk. Um, you can download our Insider's Essential Guide to Audiobooks, which goes over a bunch of the best practices I talk with today. It's got case studies in it. It's got all kinds of great info. It's got a link to our FAQ and our library in it. You can go to twinflamesstudios.com slash WIP, who made it just for you guys, and you can download that there. Um, I'm not a spam artist. We don't have a, like a big, hairy sales funnel for you guys to go into. We genuinely want to get to know you and your work. You could also book an audiobook strategy call. Um, that's a 30-minute call. You send us your um, manuscript so we can review it. We'll give you a quote. We'll talk about options, um, author narrated, professionally narrated, hybrid narration, timelines, all that good stuff. So we're happy to talk with you about all those things. And I'm going to put those links in the chat, Joe. Twinflamestudios.com slash WIP is where to go to download. All right. So much information. Let me grab those links for you guys. And then let's get into some Q&A. Um, hi, okay. Tina. Do you, yeah. um, do you want me to help you moderate the Q&A? Oh, that would be delightful. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Okay. Um, so you'll have to excuse me if I ask the question that you already covered. But um, I'm going to just 
go by the questions that have been upvoted and then just go from there. All right. So cover okay. as many as we can. If we don't cover it, um, I, uh, you guys can <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll put my email in there too. You can email me. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So it looks like our first upvoted question is um, your thoughts on an author doing their own um, voicing for the audiobook. Was there a question though? Because we talked about that a little bit. So is there a more specific question about that? Um, okay, so you covered that already. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna, okay, so, um, okay. Let's see what else was uploaded. Oh, um, do you have evidence or numbers for payback ROI for audiobook? For ROI for audiobooks. So it's going to depend on your marketing. So you can see from the numbers I showed at the beginning of the of the chat, you know, half of Americans, adult Americans listen to audiobooks. Self-help titles are up 34%. The growth is crazy. 1.6 billion dollars in sales. So the market is out there. You have to be willing to get out into it. So just like a book, an audiobook isn't going to sell your books for you. You have to make people aware of it. You do have to do small marketing, even if you're not going to do a massive push. I would much rather see you uh, do small marketing things over time consistently. That that's going to build your results over time. There's lots and lots of ways to do that that are organic, um, as well as you know. There's certainly paid traffic, but there's lots of organic things you can do to build your audience uh, out there. And that question also is a better served if we kind of break out nonfiction versus fiction, because okay. the ROI on nonfiction often has to do with how you are viewed in your industry, the opportunities and uh, relationships, and that opens doors for you because you're a published author. Okay. We did get um, a question, I think, about what types of genres tend to do well in the audio book. But um, I guess there really isn't, yeah. Let me. Let, there's only a few exceptions that don't do well in audiobooks. Um, cookbooks don't do well in audiobooks. Technical guides and travel guides don't to, tend to do as well as audiobooks. But you can we can create audio companions for them. Oh. And if it's for accessibility, we can do things for accessibility. So they're just it depends on that. Um, I will say that it's a little more challenging to get ROI on um, books of poetry. And okay. really short books um, because audiobooks across the industry are priced on length. So okay. if you have a brilliant children's book or a brilliant work of poetry, your audiobook might get priced on the low side when you go out through the major channels. So in those cases, the strategy we like to use is to have your book price be almost as high as you can make it and include the audiobook in the price as a bonus and have them downloaded off of your website rather than go through say audible but that's a whole other strategy if you're a children's author or a um poetry author oh, we could talk okay okay well i'm glad you mentioned that um children's author piece because um somebody did ask if uh children's picture book audio books are popular or how popular they are and should it be only should it only be done with animation they don't have to be done with automation um i and and there's a lot of um controversy on that uh there are some folks out there that specialize in in children audiobooks and that particular market is a little challenging because children books in general, um, you do have to do a lot of marketing to schools to get the word out um, or parenting groups or, you know, this certain special groups, sometimes um, religious organizations or nonprofits do distribution of children's books. It's just a children's is a, is a different animal um, entirely. Then so okay. there's again I I think that you're better off pairing the audiobook rather than making it a separate uh, product. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my son uses um, Epic for school, and Epic I think has some sort of AI that reads the book out loud, but it's like not an yes. actual. Like, yeah, it's audiobook. different. 
It's so, different. Um, and I have yeah. a close colleague who specializes in accessible children's audiobooks and turning them into video. They're absolutely lovely. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. So feel free to email me if you need that information. And okay. I, there was a question about the download link. So what will happen is you won't automatically get redirected to the download when you put your information in. It will show up in your email in anywhere from three to 15 minutes. And please do check your spam as something Sometimes those things go. We did uh, test that link about eight <laughs> different ways before we sent it out. So it definitely does work. Um, okay. But if the, for some reason you don't see the welcome email with the download link in your inbox in about 15 minutes, then please do email us at audiobooks at twinflamestudios.com and we'll make sure you get it, but it should work. Okay, good. I'm sure it works. Um, okay. So one that got upvoted a lot was, um, is there a particular strategy or requirement for getting audiobooks into libraries? Yeah, libraries are a whole a, a whole deal, uh, a whole deal. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, the problem with independent authors and libraries, it is very, very challenging to get your your book or your audiobook into libraries. If you can get your book into the library, you can get your audiobook into the library, but libraries will not pick up an audiobook unless they have the other title. So you have to work the, the book angle first, and then the audiobooks kind of come along as part of the package for that. Um, and yeah, so we, we personally don't work with uh, libraries because we find that selling books actually works much better through independent channels for our authors than it does through the library system. Uh, that makes sense, that makes sense. And I know yeah. that you, um, you know, that most libraries, they have to be able to um, get your audio book through Libby or Overdrive. So it's really also about the distribution channel that you're using for your book. Right, and so. the thing is, is that you can't just distribute your audio book on, on Libby. Right. It has to be exactly. requested by the library. So once yeah. you get the first library on board, it's easier, uh, more downhill. So I would say that if you give, do anything, try to work with your local library to get, right. because libraries love to work with local authors and see if you can get the digital version and the audiobook version of your book onto your local library. And then that can open the doors for, for other libraries because it gets into their catalog. Okay, good. That's a... Um good information to have yeah um, okay so we have a question here about um audiobooks being complete productions with multiple voice actors sound effects mm -hmm. music like a radio play yep what's the question oh so can can you do that do people do that i Yes, um, people do that. It tends to be done more. Full cast recordings work best when you can get all of the actors into the same space. So that makes it um, expensive. <laughs> I will okay. say that. that makes sense. Yeah, that makes it expensive, particularly for fiction, because you need them in the same studio in order to get that smooth sound. And if you're doing anything involving dialogue, they, they really need to be in a the same place. You can do it, you can do it virtually. Um, but, uh, I, cause I just said, someone named Michelle said, that's what we do when we do it virtually. Do you do it for audiobooks or do you do it for radio drama? Um, so I'd be curious because we use podcasting platforms when like the book we had 35 voices in. Um, we, it, it can be done. It is, can be a little challenging and can get up there in, in budget. So it just kind of depends on what your goals are and how much you need to, uh, what your budget is. Okay, good. Yeah. I wondered about that. I've never listened to a book that had like a full, like, oh, cast of characters. So, um, okay. Let me see. Um, do you produce audiobooks in Spanish? We can produce audiobooks in Spanish, but we haven't thus far. Uh, we have had a number of requests for people who want to produce their audiobooks in Spanish, but the main sticking point seems to be that they have to produce their uh, script in Spanish first, 
And okay. so it just depends on if they're if they're a native Spanish speaker themselves and they have their book authentically translated into Spanish, then yes, absolutely. We can find uh, probably a, a native speaking Spanish um, narrator to, to narrate. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. Good to know. Um, if what are the alternatives to using Aud Audible? Like if you don't want to go through ACX? Uh, find Away Voices. Okay. Find Away Voices. Okay. I will um, include that in the replay. Okay. Um, we have a couple of kind of technical questions. Mm -hmm. sure. so one is somebody was asking, um, her recording had um, popping from electricity in the room, and she also read it a bit too fast. So is it worth re-recording it? Or... Yes. Okay. Yeah. Acing, That's you don't, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah, if you don't, if this, if the pacing is, and, and, and I don't know if that's your opinion or your beta listener's opinion. So always had, get a second opinion, a bunch of second opinions about the speeds. Usually audiobooks tend to be read a little bit slower than average voice. Obviously I move through this super fast, right? But if I were to be talking and I were going to be narrating an audiobook, I'd much rather talk in a speed like this. It would be very smooth and I'd be bringing in a voice that was something you could really listen to for anywhere from four to six to eight hours. So very different cadence from my natural speaking voice. I have to be conscious of it and conscious of my breathing. I think that's also like a good argument for using a professional voice recording artist. It, it can because, be, it can be. We, that's why you know. we direct people because we slow you down when we give you yeah. rehearsal and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. The other technical question is somebody wanted to know what kind of webcam and audio you're using because your screencasting is crystal clear. Why, thank you. Um, <laughs> I actually have a, a webcam with a halo light on it that I got okay. off of Amazon. Um, and this is, this is my trusty Yeti. So, um, yeah, for sure. I, I love Yeti. Uh, but yeah, I also I have, have like five lights set up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Right, I don't so do that on a secret. daily basis. Yeah, that's the exactly. secret, everybody. Good lighting yeah. is always the secret. Um, yeah. Okay, we have about a minute left. So let me see. Um, While you're looking up a question, I just want to thank everyone if, if, who might need to, to go. I look forward to connecting with you all further. And again, feel free to, uh, to grab those links and um, uh, make sure that you, know, you, you reach out anytime. Uh, it doesn't have to be now. It could be later. Whenever you're ready to talk about audiobooks, or you get follow-up questions. Um, we're here. We're not going anywhere. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I think the last question that we'll leave on is um, what can somebody expect to pay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For creating, like, I, not just in, you know, working with a production company like yours, but the whole process of producing an audiobook. Yeah, so Soup to Nuts, our authors on average from the moment we start to the end, which is all the production, all of the publishing, all of the distribution, it's going to be anywhere from three to 5K. Um, and that depends on the length of the audiobook. And usually we're talking about a book that is somewhere in the 40,000, 60, 70, 80,000 range in, in that range. Um, so not a short book, uh, definitely something that's, that's fairly robust. Audiobooks sell best when they're over three hours long. So kind of over 30,000, 30,000 words and more. Um, not that you can't sell a short book, but that tends to you know, be even better if it's over three hours or more in terms of the way that uh, pricing works and in terms of the way the algorithms work. So okay. that's what you can expect. You can DIY, um, especially working with a professional narrator, but it really varies across the board. You can pay, end up paying um, $100 uh, per finished hour, which is not something we talked about, but hundred. let's call it $100 for every 10,000 words for a narrator. You can pay $1,000 for 10,000 words, uh, per 10,000 words with a narrator. There's a lot of room in between and working with narrators um, is a whole other thing. In the guide, by the way, there is more information about working with narrators and what questions to ask in the process. Okay, 
All right, great. So I think maybe your guys will answer some of these questions in here. It is 11.02, so I want to respect everybody's time. Um, Tina, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we really look forward to hearing more from you. Um, and for everybody else, um, we will send out all the resources and the links that Tina shared today in a replay email. And of course, Tina put her email address in the chat so you can reach out if we didn't get to your question today in the Q&A. So um, Tina, I'll let you say your last parting words and then we'll sign off. No, I'll just say in parting, thank you again for your time and attention today and for listening and for being willing to share your voice with the world. Um, as leaders, sometimes the people who are looking for their own voice use ours to help to gain their own. And um, I know that I have, you know, written the, 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 the work of many other people and mentors, and some of those mentors came in the form of books. So uh, I commend you for being that mentor for others. And that can go fiction or nonfiction because that uh, the, the power of stories is universal. So thank you all today. And I look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.